Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in The War of the World. Just as Hearst had seen the boom in popular newspapers and turned it to his own ends, so Wells grabbed for the medium of radio. Now for the first time, a single man's voice could reach into living rooms everywhere. Wells not only seized this power, he used it more inventively, more recklessly than anyone else. When we looked about 21, I maybe he might have been 22. He was awfully young. I mean, he was a man who, um, he didn't think, he just did. Wells was a young man who courted danger. That was always an element of his success. In the theater, he demanded magic. Characters had to appear from nowhere or levitate into the sky. Actors were at risk. There were broken bones, fist fights. He liked the reflection of light on a real dagger, but one night, he ran a fellow actor through, severed an artery, and almost killed him. It was a risky way to live, even when it did work and audiences cheered. When they didn't love Wells or his shows, that was worse. He went on a tear one night, and he went through the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, one floor, breaking down all the doors and scaring the inhabitants to death, most of the inhabitants being fellow actors. The next day, the manager called and said, there's about $40,000 worth of damage. Radio was supposed to pay the bills, but with Mercury Theater on the air, Wells was even worse. He'd just make up shows as he went. There was nobody that did radio the way Orson did. I mean, Orson was, you know, so daring and so unbound by rules that, you know, it was always you always knew Orson would break the rule if it was worth breaking. He told me how it worked. They would rehearse for a week without him, or for five days without him. And uh, he'd get there in the morning, and they'd run it for him, and then he'd start to change things. And he'd be changing them usually right up until just before airtime. We would come to the studio with a book, <laughs> with pages, with, with scissors, and pencils, and we'd be sitting there right till the last minute putting together the damn show. <laughs> It happened many, many times. That happened all, even with the, with the War of the Worlds. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. He recognized the fact that his audience was sensitized to having their favorite shows interrupted by uh, news of some disaster, some latest disaster, be it in Europe or be it in, in the Far East, but something that was threatening, something that was encroaching, something that was terrifying. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. Hopewell is a small country town where all the people usually knew each other. That's where I worked for seven years as a telephone operator. When I uh, would come to work around five or six o'clock at night on Sunday night, it was very slow. So slow that you could almost read a book or do a little crocheting or whatever. People were switching dials all the time. And we were on between Winchell and Jack Benny. And we were not a, prop, a, a very popular program. Wells knew the bulk of the audience was tuned into rival NBC and the Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy show. But he also knew that 12 minutes in, Bergen and his dummy would take a break, cut to music. 
That's when Wells landed his Martians. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large, as large as a bear. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black. I had just finished my homework. My older sister had gone in to take her Sunday night bath because next day was school. And the first thing I realized was that my parents were shushing us. They kept saying, quiet, something's going on. Wait a minute, something's happening. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. The Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires, the, the gas tank, tank for the automobiles. Spreading everywhere, coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. There was a point when we heard nothing. It seemed like they cut away, and, and there was silence, and that only intensified our interest more. Orson held the pause, and he, everybody was waiting for him to cue it, and it was up to him. To, he, was, he was actually directing it from the floor, and... Uh, Orson just held that moment. He just kept holding it, and he wouldn't let anything happen. And then he finally said, all right. And everybody said, oh, my God, you know, he just held this silence. I guess about quarter of nine, I realized that something was radically wrong because it would be very slow ordinarily at that time. Well, we have a, board, a switchboard like this with numbers and lights, and they lit up like a Christmas tree. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. Just one moment, please. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill. Their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. Well, during the course of the broadcast, which was an hour, we noticed a uh, uniformed policeman in the lobby. <laughs> That's what I knew. So, uh oh, something's wrong. Is there something wrong with the show or the after horses for something he did or what? I had no idea. But there was, we knew something was wrong. And uh, shortly after that is when David Taylor came out while we were in the middle of the show, and he whispered to Orson, for God's sake, you know, interrupt this thing and tell everybody it's only a show. And Orson said, no way. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. No, 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 he wouldn't do it. When all of a sudden the executive in charge walks up to you and said, listen, my God, you're sharing people to, to, to death. Please, uh, interrupt. Tell them it's only a show. And Orson said, what do you mean, interrupt? No way, they're scared? Good, they're supposed to be scared. Now let me finish. Bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. My mother said, turn it to another station. We did, and they were having their regularly scheduled program, and my mother said, they're not as sharp as CBS. My father was quite upset, and he hung wet dishcloths all around the windows. He said it would absorb the gases. I remember my mother wanting to call on the telephone. Her father and her sisters lived in New York, and she couldn't get through. The lines were busy. She just wanted a call to say goodbye. This is the end now. Black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. When we went out of the studio, everybody, we started answering the phones. What, what's going on, and where are they? And it was unbelievable. Uh, and I never forget, then I looked down the end of the hall there, and there was Paley, head of CBS, in his bathrobe, in, in slippers. Bathroom is holding court, just wanting to know what the hell was going on. It was absolutely bedlam. It was bedlam. It's the only time that, in all the years that I worked with Orson, that I ever saw him slightly afraid. I don't think that he quite knew what was going to happen. Uh, it's very possible that he thought that this could have uh, ended his career, but it did exactly the opposite. Do you want me to speak now? I'm sorry. Of course, we are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. It came rather as a great surprise to us that a story, the fine H.G. Wells classic.